It's morning on Sunday, Australia's favourite drug and the one that's doing most harm. Why our governments won't bite the bullet on alcohol. We'll also look at one of the most influential industries when it comes to political lobbying, that's the liquor trade. Alcohol kills three times as many Australians as any other drug of dependence, yet booze is not even on the federal government's drug website. Being the biggest pusher of alcohol, it's not surprising that government will not support mandatory warnings on product labels. When I buy cough medicine, the bottle contains warnings about me driving after drinking cough medicine, about using machinery and even drinking alcohol. And yet when I buy alcohol, which does far more damage than cough medicine does, there's no warning at all. It's very hard to get a good news story uh, about alcohol in the media. It's more fashionable to be anti-alcohol and to take some, highlight some of the problems which really represent the minority situation. Yes, alcohol, Australia's favourite drug and what it's costing us. That's our cover story this morning. It would be a big improvement if Australians understood that alcohol is a drug. Uh, it does more damage than illicit drugs, all the illicit drugs put together, and that we need to review the place of alcohol in our culture. cover story. Alcohol is one of Australia's biggest killers, taking three times more lives each year than illicit drugs combined. A new study indicates that up to two million Australians are drinking at dangerous levels and the risk is serious including brain damage. Well today Sunday examines alcohol's hidden toll and how the liquor lobby is still sending a message to government reinforced by political donations that alcohol is not addictive and should be given special treatment over other drugs. Adam Shand reports. It goes with summer like sand and surf. An icy cold drink is the perfect partner to every Australian moment. Forget about the drought and global warming this summer because grog is raining from the sky. But you will drink in moderation, even if the pushers tell you something quite different. Look at this season's hot new product, Bomb. But with 8% alcohol, well, it's aptly named. The young binge drinkers will love it. The heck is palm. Like most young men, Myron Pawlik used to love getting bombed too. It helped him forget his time as a national serviceman in Vietnam. But then he began to forget everything. Like sort of mini flashbacks I, I get. Or I just totally lose concentration. I can drive for five kilometres and not remember, you know, where, where I was driving. I try very hard to concentrate, but uh, I, you know, the concentration span seems to um, be very limited sometimes. You won't see Myron Pawlik and his fellow addicts on the beer commercials. He's one of the two million Australians who's risked brain damage from excessive drinking. And like most people, Myron had no idea he was doing it. Can you get the alcohol? And the drugs? The first time many Australians learnt of alcohol-related brain injury was last month, when a group called Abias launched its Hangover for Life campaign. We were not expecting the reaction that we got uh, this week at the launch of the Hangover for Life campaign. It, it compl really completely blew us uh, away. And reasons for that, I, I think we struck a chord with most Australians. Sonia Burton of Arbias broke the news that if men drink six drinks a day and more for eight years, they risk brain injury. For women, she said, it was only three drinks a day. I mean, there are levels that many of us consider to be social drinking. Uh, and, and yet it's enough that if you, if you consume those levels consistently for a period of time, you will begin to show the early signs of alcohol-related brain damage, not know, and if you don't know, are likely to continue drinking and then end up with severe alcohol-related brain damage. Our bias wants government and the alcohol manufacturers to fund a $20 million education campaign. Our bias also wants labels placed on alcohol containers warning of the dangers of excessive consumption, that alcohol is addictive and can damage unborn babies. There are companies overseas now, alcohol companies now overseas, who as a measure of good corporate social responsibility are voluntarily placing uh, labels on uh, their alcohol products. 
Gordon Broderick runs the Distilled Spirits Industry Council of Australia, one of the country's most powerful lobby groups. And as far as he's concerned, there's nothing wrong with Myron Pollock's brain. There's no real research, uh, whether it's been commissioned by industry or anybody else, which shows um, the level of potential brain damage by abuse of alcohol. Isn't it a truism, though, that alcohol kills brain cells? Isn't that... We all grew up learning that. We can, we can, we can waste a few because we've got millions more, isn't that the...? Well, I think that that's the truism, uh, and I think there's, uh, you know, evidence that people have had reasonable consumption of alcohol who, over a long period of time who are in fact not brain damaged. So I think by one's own observation and anecdotal that um, it's not a mortal sin to consume alcohol and you're not necessarily putting your brain at damage. I'm getting drunk tonight and I won't quit drinking till I'm out like a light. Welcome to the flat earth world of big alcohol where every scientific fact is contestable. Few would argue that alcohol is a drug of dependence except the people who sell it. I don't think alcohol is addictive, no. There's a fair bit of evidence to suggest that, that, that that's disingenuous. Well, some people, um, some people have a problem with alcohol, but the majority of people who consume alcohol don't. So I think if, if everybody that consumed alcohol had a problem, then you could argue that it was addictive. But I think the, the vast majority of people drink either don't drink or drink alcohol responsibly. Yes, in, in, a, in a sense, uh, it was addictive. Uh, the addictiveness and, and the support it gives you. And if you, if you got those two together, you know, you feel, you feel as though you can get on with life. Grog cost Myron Pollock his marriage. But remember, alcohol is not addictive. It's just like what the tobacco executives told the US Congress about nicotine as late as 1994. You're not the big bad, you know? lobbyist uh, injecting ambiguity into the debate? I don't think that we endeavour to inject ambiguity. What we try to inject is balance. The Distilled Spirits Industry Council, made up of nine multinational companies, is a powerful organisation that enjoys easy access to government. When Sunday visited Gordon Broderick, he'd just signed a $20,000 cheque to the Victorian branch of the Liberal Party. How much lobbying do you do? I don't think the industry is that powerful or that influential. Uh, I mean, I go to, to Canberra regularly to put the industry's position, but um, a lot of scientists and academics uh, who have a contrary view are on boards of review and things like NH and MRC, so I think that their sphere of influence would be greater than the industry's. Each year, Gordon Broderick stages a party in the Great Hall of Parliament in Canberra, where up to 300 parliamentarians drink for free and mingle with Bundaberg Rum's mascot, the Bundy Bear. While corporations can make political donations, they think they're going to buy influence. Um, I'd like to see the Bundy Bear out of the Great Hall of Parliament. I don't think there's any role there um, for the Bundy Bear. Um, but on a broader point, I think we need to ensure that corporations and the alcohol industry can't simply buy access and influence amongst politicians. Otherwise, um, that's going to make it harder for the public to understand the truth about our alcohol problem. Jeff Munro doesn't get invited to meet the Bundy Bear. In his role running the alcohol arm of the Australian Drug Foundation, he represents the unfashionable view that alcohol is a highly addictive drug. It would be a big improvement if Australians understood that alcohol is a drug. Uh, it does more damage than illicit drugs. All the illicit drugs put together and that we need to review the place of alcohol in our culture. This is the website for the National Drugs Campaign of the Federal Government. It's got information here on all the drugs available and their effects. Amphetamines, ice, speed, ecstasy, everything gets a mention except alcohol, the drug that kills three times more Australians than all these drugs combined. It's an amazing oversight, like talking about big animals and forgetting to mention elephants. I think consumers are very confused because on the one hand they hear that alcohol is not addictive, that it might be good for them in some circumstances and yet it does enormous damage. There's no doubt alcohol is a very ambiguous product. In some cases uh, it doesn't do harm, um, but on, on the other hand it causes enormous devastation. The wine industry, 
particularly important to my home state of South Australia. It's not just consumers getting confused. This Overseas year, Assistant Health Minister Christopher Pine was quoted as denying that alcohol killed more people than illicit Despite drugs this, combined. You wonder where he might have picked up that piece of disinformation. I'm sure Minister Pine became aware that his statement was wrong, but I haven't yet seen uh, him uh, correct that statement. So he's or never apologised for, for a blatantly wrong statement about, about that? As far as I know, he hasn't um, apologised or retracted that statement. Just for the record, let's clear this up. That alcohol kills three times more than illicit drugs combined each year is indisputable. It's a government-issued fact. That's not counting the deaths by misadventure or violence. As the federal government fights its war on drugs, Victorian Deputy Chief Magistrate Paul Smith sees the casualties of another war played out weekly between violent drunks. Unfortunately, there aren't statistics being kept in relation to the um, factor or the role that alcohol plays in relation to violent crime. Anecdotally, I can say, um, I think it's about 65, 68 per cent or something like that. About two thirds of the assault cases that I hear have alcohol as a factor. And yet we're having this war on ice in particular yes. as, a, as a generator of random violence. Yes. How does it rank with, compared to alcohol as a generator of this sort of problem? Well, in my experience, it's uh, nowhere near uh, as great a factor as alcohol is. Uh, alcohol, in my view, in my experience, is the biggest single factor in relation to crimes of violence. It's a popular myth that jails are full of drug addicts. And yes, that's true, but the problem is not illicit drugs. The drug of choice is alcohol. 40% of the prison population in Victoria has an alcohol abuse problem or an alcohol addiction problem. We know that in America, 65% of all people awaiting trial for murder or awaiting sentence for murder um, have not only an alcohol problem but have an acquired brain impairment thought to be due to alcohol. It's very hard to get a good news story uh, about alcohol in the media. It's more fashionable to be anti-alcohol and to take some, highlight some of the problems which really represent the minority situation. Um, but the industry has worked very hard um, with decision makers and with its own programs over a long period of time. Well, how many clinicians out of 10 would say now there's no problem or it's ambiguous? Um, I hesitate to say zero because one never says zero in medicine, but as close to zero as could possibly be. So no doubt at all? No doubt at all. What really you need is long-term education campaigns and that's why the industry's become a major supporter and initiator of a new organisation called Drinkwise Australia whose one of its principal criteria is to change the Australian drinking culture. Drinkwise Australia is a government industry initiative aimed at educating Australians about proper drinking culture. But again nowhere in its material is there a mention of alcohol's addictive properties. But Drinkwise Chief Executive Mike McAvoy has broken ranks with his industry members. Alcohol may be addictive without a doubt, um, uh, but uh, only a small proportion of the population do go on uh, to become uh, addi addicted or dependent to alcohol. Probably about 5% five, five of, of the drinking population will go on to become dependent. There are a second group who may, uh, who may have problems with alcohol. They may be problem drinkers or very heavy drinkers. Um, but n not, again, not necessarily dependent on the, on the drink, uh, on, on alcohol. In your experience, what's, what's a bigger problem for the community, illicit drugs or alcohol? Alcohol, without a doubt, alcohol. So why then did the federal government commit $150 million to battling amphetamines and only $5 million in funding drink-wise? If you had funding that was appropriate to the problem, how much would you get a year? Five times that? Uh, I think you'd be probably talking in the um, in the billions. Uh, that the impact on society, if, you know, if, if we had the responsibility for for the, for the total um, country's response to alcohol and matched it with what uh, what was being received, uh, what we know uh, basically is the cost to society, we'd be talking in the order of you know two two billion dollars. Even with matching funding from industry, Drinkwise is merely a band-aid to hide a gaping wound. The Australian Drug Foundation is also chronically underfunded. Our budget here for the whole organisation is about $5 million. 
It's uh, about half a product launch for an alcohol company. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the industry spends $5 million per product launch, and it launches many products during the year. And it may be that um, companies will only take their responsibility seriously when they're brought to account through, through, the, through the courts. As the boss of Melbourne firm Slater & Gordon, lawyer Peter Gordon has chased a lot of ambulances. But even he wouldn't take on big alcohol. He says class actions are doomed to failure. The adverse events which uh, alcohol causes are very diverse. The number of manufacturers are very diverse and the issues are very diverse. So the possibility of a class action um, is uh, remote, I think, beyond uh, any worthiness of serious consideration. Government is the number one beneficiary of alcohol and tobacco sales in this country, raking in more than $7 billion a year in taxing our deadly vices. Being the biggest pusher of alcohol, it's not surprising that government will not support mandatory warnings on product labels. When I buy cough medicine, the bottle contains warnings about me driving after drinking cough medicine, about using machinery and even drinking alcohol. And yet when I buy alcohol, which does far more damage than cough medicine does, there's no warning at all. I mean, cough medicine kills no one as far as I know in this country, and it's a measure of our complacency about alcohol problems, and it's a measure of the power of the industry. But nobody is saying that Australians should stop drinking, but rather that they are able to make informed decisions just as consumers overseas of the same product. Australian wine producers, for example, have for over the last 10 years been required to label their products uh, prior to export because countries uh, demand that standard. They demand that standard. And we then use a different label here. I think there's enough people out there who would say, watch this interview and say, he's saying alcohol is not addictive. I think there's enough people out there who, who, who can't go throughout a day without a drink who, who disagree with you. Well, I don't think that we seek to introduce ambiguity. I mean, what we seek to do is make sure that a debate is balanced. I mean, people make assertions and then they like to believe that those assertions are fact. Um, if we wish to present facts, we are accused of um, introducing ambiguity. I think people are entitled to make their decisions based on, on evidence. Blue Monday ball. Good. And that's all we owe any drinker, the truth. There was a time when Myron Pawlik thought his disability came from just getting old. Now he knows it was alcohol that hurt him and he's made the journey to recovery. I don't think I could have done this interview, you know, if, if, if I was back the way I was. There was. You wouldn't have got, you know, you would have got very little out of me. I wouldn't have been able to express myself, uh, uh, tell you, you know, about my problems. Whereas now, um, I sort of came in and I, I have no problem with that. Uh, I, I know what, what I, I know what, uh, where I've been and I know what I had and I know what I had to do and I've, and I've done it and I shall continue this uh, well for as long as it takes. Adam Shand reporting on the liquor lobby and the radically different approaches from two of its spokesmen. Back with more of Sunday in a moment including the latest news and sport.